and it is gone. But while mortals rise and perish, God endures unchanging on. Praise Him, praise Him, praise Him, praise Him, praise the High Eternal One. Our reading is taken from the Gospel of St. John, chapter 1, verses from 1 to 18. I'm reading from the message version of the New Testament. The passage is entitled as The Life Light. The Word was first, the Word present to God, God present to the Word. The Word was God, in readiness for God from day one. Everything was created through Him. Nothing, not one thing, came into being without Him. What came into existence was life, and the life was light to live by. The life light blazed out of the darkness and the darkness couldn't put it out. There once was a man, his name John, sent by God to point out the way to the lifelight. He came to show everyone where to look, who to believe in. John was not himself the light. He was there to show the way to the light. The life light was the real thing. Every person entering life he brings into light. He was in the world. The world was there through him. And yet the world didn't even notice. He came to his own people, but they didn't want him. But whoever did want him, who believed he was who he claimed and would do what he said, he made to be their true selves, their child of God selves. These are the God begotten, not blood begotten, not flesh begotten, not sex begotten. The Word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. We saw the glory with our own eyes, the one of a kind glory, like Father, like Son, generous inside and out, true from start to finish. John pointed him out and called, This is the one, the one I told you was coming after me, but in fact was ahead of me. He was, he has always been ahead of me, has always had the first word. We all live off his generous bounty, gift after gift after gift. We got the basics from Moses and then this exuberant giving and receiving, this endless knowing and understanding, 
All this came through Jesus, the Messiah. No one has ever seen God, not so much as a glimpse. This one of a kind God expression who exists at the very heart of the Father has made him plain as day. Amen. This book, Sophie's World, was in its day an international bestseller. It's really an introduction to philosophy, which may not make it sound like a, a page turner, but it's set up as a novel uh, and is a great read. Let me read a small section for you. What is the most important thing in life? If we ask someone living on the edge of starvation, the answer is food. If we ask someone dying of cold, the answer is warmth. If we put the same question to someone who feels lonely and isolated, the answer will probably be the company of other people. But when those basic needs have been satisfied, will there be something that everybody needs? Philosophers think so. They believe that man cannot live by bread alone. Of course, everyone needs food and everyone needs love and care. But there is something else apart from that which everyone needs. And that is to figure out who we are and why we are here. So there we have two big questions. Who am I and why am I here? Philosophical questions, yes, but deep theological questions for sure. Who am I and why am I here? The first of these questions is one of identity and the second is one of purpose. Today, we're going to think on the first question, who am I? This question of our identity. And next week, we'll consider the second, why am I here? What's the point of me being on earth? What is my purpose? The author of Sophie's World offers us two thoughts as we begin this quest of discovering our identity, who I am. He begins by saying that we begin to discover who we are when we discover that we're not just ourselves, in other words, that there are others around us and that it's in connecting with them that we begin to discover who we are in terms of our connectedness to others. Maybe we can think of it this way, that it's impossible to understand ourselves without thinking about all those around us. Look for a moment at the pebbles on this stony beach. You could hardly think of one without the others. They somehow belong together. The second thing he suggests, and this is a new addition to the original writing of the book. He says that we begin to understand who we are when we realise that we are connected with the world in which we live. And he goes as far as to say that we can't understand who we are 
we'll never have a true sense of our identity unless we understand that it's somehow wrapped up in our connectedness with where we are. So two things as we begin to answer. First of all, our identity is in our connectedness with other people and in our connectedness with the environment. As for our connectedness to the creation, right at the beginning, the book of Genesis makes it abundantly clear that we are part of what God has made. We have a a special place within that. We are set as stewards over creation, but nonetheless, we are part of it and our connectedness to it is vital to who we are. I wonder who you see when you look up close at yourself. Who are you? What is your identity? In recent years, of course, we've seen the rise of so-called identity politics. We hear people saying all the time, I identify as this or that or the next thing. I guess as I think about myself, my Scottishness is important to me, but I also understand myself to be British. I identify, I think about myself as a male, as a husband, as a father, As a son, there are so many aspects to how I might define myself. As I look to answer the question, who am I? Everything that I've described so far is important to me. My connectedness to others, my connectedness to the creation, And those other things that I've mentioned, my sense of who I am in relation to the place I come from, the people I'm part of, and my understanding of myself in relation to family, those who are immediately around me. All of that is important as I think about my identity, who I am. But as a Christian, there's something more. Of course, there's something much more. Right there at the very start of John's Gospel in the first chapter, we hear the phrase, children of God. Children of God. My friends, here is the key ultimately to who I am. Ultimately, My identity is as a child of God. Yes, all those other things matter in terms of how I piece together my understanding of who I am but they are all arranged underneath this key and crucial and most important conviction that first and foremost, I am a child of God. This underpins everything else. And without that, there's something essential missing. I am a child of God. That's who I am. That's who I identify as. My relating to other people, my relating to 
this planet all flow out of the fact that first and foremost I am related to a loving God who in his grace and through his son has declared me to be his child. It's on this solid rock that I build this firm foundation of being a child of God. And this is my identity. This is who I am. But even then, there's something else that must be said. And it's this. I am only a child of God because of what Jesus has done for me. Because Jesus came into the world for me. Because Jesus lived his life for me. And in the end, because Jesus gave his life for me. That's why I can say with confidence in response to the question, Who am I? I am a child of God because of Jesus. Friends, let us never, ever take that for granted. Let us never, ever become blasé about this truth that Jesus gave himself for us, that we might be children of God. Let us then keep his cross ever before us as a reminder of this truth, let us hold fast to his cross. By the cross, we are children of God.
Lord God, we give thanks for all those who nurture faith through work with children, in discipleship, in the leading of worship, in outreach to the world around. We give thanks and pray for those who engage with children and young people in Sunday schools and messy church, midweek activities and holiday clubs, youth groups and school chaplaincies. Inspire them as they keep our young people involved in different ways. Encourage them as in faith they plant seeds in hearts and minds. We give thanks and pray for those who lead Bible studies and discussion groups, wrestling with the issues of the day, seeking to open minds and mature faith. We give thanks and pray for those who are leading worship at this time, challenged to adapt to new ways of engaging. We give thanks for new opportunities to touch hearts and minds, and we pray for discernment as we move forward, what to take with us, what to leave behind. We give thanks and pray for those in the ministries of the church, parish ministers, ordained local ministers, chaplains and specialist ministries, deacons, readers and locums. Grant them strength and wisdom in these difficult days imagination and openness as they seek your guiding. We pray for those discerning a call to ministry, those in training, those seeking their first charge. Be their light, their support, their assurance and their questioning in their formation. We give thanks and pray for the members of the New Faith Nurture Forum and for the staff working from their homes for their commitment to the life and work of the church in these uncertain times, supporting, resourcing, enabling, encouraging, responding to change, working alongside congregations, concerned for the poorest and most marginalised. We give thanks and pray for each other, for the assurance of your love and care, for your peace in our lives, for hearts on fire with the good news of Jesus Christ, for imagination and courage and mission and fresh expressions of faith, for willingness to embrace the challenges of the changing days ahead. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
sins and my sorrows and made them his very own. He bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. Sing how marvelous May the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you all today and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>